Well, all right, welcome to class for today, Issues in Environmental Science. Uh, this is the 12th week of our class, so we're closing in on the end of our time together. Um, this is gonna be one of the last weeks of lectures. I guess the lecture next week will be on climate change. And then in the following, the remaining weeks, it will be your turn. Uh, the different teams will be making presentations of their class projects. Uh, these are PowerPoints that uh, accompany the reports or PowerPoint-like uh, presentations that accompany the reports that you've uh, that you've all been working on. Um, we're going to continue our discussion uh, that we started on Tuesday of food production as an environmental issue. Uh, and I'll be uh, yesterday or Tuesday rather, we were talking about agriculture, terrestrial agriculture. And uh, we described human beings as a species now currently totally dependent on uh, agriculture uh, or as artificial means of food production. Um, but of course, uh, agriculture is only part of the story of how people find food to eat. And the other part is uh, marine uh, food production, including fishing. And more recently, the expansion of mariculture, aquaculture, taking wild species of fish and rearing them uh, much as we do with uh, livestock. Um, very different set of circumstances for that. And so the um, so that's what we'll be talking about, uh, humans and the food from the sea. I'll be uh, starting with a discussion of the Peruvian anchovy because that's a, an example of a fishery that uh, brings out many different uh, problems that can be associated with fisheries. Uh, explains why fisheries are so abundant, or why there's variation in the population size, which can have a direct impact on um, the social and economic consequences of fishing. And we'll uh, bring up this concept of maximum sustainable yield and overfishing, which are sort of two parallel uh, topics that attend most of the fisheries management issues that are raised. And we'll look at the concept of shifting baselines, so how difficult it is to assess the true state of marine ecosystems, particularly ecosystems in which there's been a long history of fishing. And we'll conclude by looking at methods of fishing and aquaculture. So there's a lot of material to cover in this in this lecture, so I'm just going to dive right in. But I'll before I do, I'll just let open up for any questions about uh, where we're at. I should say that. Um, I think there are five teams yet who have not yet scheduled, uh, five teams remaining who have not yet scheduled conferences to go over your milestone three submissions. And you need to do that. Um, you know, it, it really will improve your grade for sure. Uh, if you have a, uh, if you meet with uh, Carrie or me um, for revision. So uh, if there are any questions about that, and, and I guess uh, also I, I'm aware that there were two teams in which um, uh, one of the members of the team had problems with COVID, uh, including you know serious symptoms that were making it difficult for that team member to uh, complete their uh, component of the or their part of the of the project. And so we'll certainly accommodate that, um, but I have to do it on a case by case basis. So um, those teams should schedule a conference with me to talk about how that we can work around to support their student who's sick, their team member who's sick, and make but still make sure that everybody else on the team is getting a proper full credit. So before I start my lecture, are there questions about the Milestone 3 or the conferences or anything about the, the course? Questions? Okay, hearing no questions, let me start my, uh, my lecture. So um, human beings uh, have depended on the ocean uh, for a long time hundreds of thousands of years. And in the continental US, the continental North America, there's archeological evidence that confirms that dependence. And most recently, I guess a couple of years ago, archeologists exploring uh, Calvert Island in British Columbia discovered a human footprint. And here it is, it's uh, not very dramatic, but nonetheless, it is a human footprint. Uh, that was preserved in coastal sediments, and they, the, they were able to date the, um, the 
time that the footprint was formed based on uh, carbon dating of the of material in the in the soil where the footprint was made and that confirms that the footprint was 13,000 years old um, which places it right around the time when human populations had migrated from Asia across the Bering Sea land bridge and begun um, expanding into the North American continent and North and South America began expanding across the Americas. So there have been two uh, competing theories about how this expansion took place. One is that uh, these early uh, humans uh, coming into North America and to the Americas sort of spread through the, the forest and, and uh, prairie uh, landscape uh, as hunters and gatherers. Uh, another theory suggests that they may have followed the coasts and following the coasts uh, would have been a uh, this coastal theory of human migration would have been a, uh, uh, a, 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 a um, effective way for uh, human, early humans to have survived because there is plentiful food. Um, the climate along the coasts tends to be more moderate than inland where severe winters and uh, could have affected uh, survival. Um, there's a lot of you know kelp forests, oyster beds, seal, fish populations that would have been uh, potential food supplies. Um, that's not to say that uh, Native Americans in North America didn't practice agriculture. In fact, there were very large um, communities of uh, Native Americans who had agricultural practices that were quite advanced and were able to form uh, cities and, and city-like um, uh, communities based on agriculture. Um, but the early post-glacial coast was a very productive uh, environment, um, and uh, that production of the coast, you know, when the uh, humans reached the uh, Florida Peninsula, there's every reason to show that this dependence on coastal resources for food continued. And the evidence that we have for that are um, the uh, large uh, middens of oysters. Middens are, are a pile, or what a midden archaeologically is a pile of debris. It's basically a garbage pile. Um, that's the, the, the materials that uh, a human settlement would have used and then disposed of. And so archaeologists like to dig into these uh, middens because that's that preserves evidence of the lifestyle and practices of the community that, that built the midden. Well, what they see uh, in the Florida uh, uh, population centers are huge accumulations of oyster shells. So oysters were a very important food stock for the Native American tribes in the Florida region. And generally, the uh, early settlers or the Native Americans settling in Florida uh, would have enjoyed abundant food resources from the uh, estuary and coastal areas up and down the, the Florida Peninsula. Uh, it's interesting to note that um, when the Spanish uh, conquerors arrived in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, they, uh, as they expanded into and explored the Gulf, they had a great deal of difficulty feeding themselves. And um, whereas they, they, they described the uh, natives that they encountered as being tall and muscular and, and fit and well-fed, um, their food and the food of the Native Americans came from fish and, and coastal resources that for whatever reason, culturally, the Spanish had not learned to uh, exploit and utilize. So in many ways, the native populations of Florida before the Spanish uh, occupation were better adapted to the uh, marine uh, sources of, of food and nutrition that, um, that are abundant in this area. So, um, you know, this is by way of saying that, uh, that human population and the development of human populations, although we uh, talked about the importance of agriculture in a previous lecture, the um, uh, relation to coasts was also very important. It's important as a source of foodstuff, which is what we're discussing here, but it was also important as a means for transportation and, and um, uh, migration. So people were able to migrate along coastal areas and feed themselves as they went, form settlements. Um, some of these settlements became permanent and, uh, and you know, tribes uh, developed those regions. Okay, so that's a, you know, that's a little bit, a brief overview of the history of, uh, of human populations and uh, coastal areas. So 
fish and marine food production uh, has been a component of, of uh, human uh, lifestyle for a long period of time. All right, now we want to look at um, when we talked about the uh, practices of agriculture in, in uh, Europe, uh, one of the things that I said was that by the middle of the 19th century, so in the 1850s and thereabouts, the uh, agricultural production in Europe had sort of reached the limits of uh, what food production could support or could be supported by the practice of fertilization through manure, through animal products. Um, and um, as a consequence, the uh, amount of food produced per acre and the availability of food for the increasing populations in Europe uh, began to be a real issue. And there were um, instances of starvation and famines, the most famous of which was the, uh, the uh, uh, Irish potato famines, when the Irish uh, population, uh, which had grown dependent on the uh, potato, a foodstuff imported from uh, South America, um, when a, a, uh, a plant a white uh, began destroying the, um, the Irish uh, potato crop, the result was, was famine. And so um, uh, the populations in Europe were right at the edge of what could be supported by traditional practices in agriculture. Well, they got a bit of a respite um, when, the, uh, when explorers uh, sailing up the coast of South America uh, discovered a series of islands off the coast of Chile and uh, Peru called the Guano Islands. And these were relatively small, rocky um, islands that had been colonized by a particular type of bird, the cormorant, uh, particularly the Guanai cormorant. And these birds are colonial. And the picture in the upper left here, you see um, you know, many hundreds of birds, uh, and they form these nests these nests are built up from the guano, the waste products of these birds. And the uh, islands offshore were essentially uh, rain free. There's very little uh, natural precipitation that occurs on these islands. And as a consequence of you know, thousands and thousands of years of the uh, cormorants nesting on these islands, the guano had built up to really massive proportions. And so the picture on the uh, lower left here uh, shows the Guano Islands, you know, circa uh, 1860 or 1870. Uh, and there were, you know, uh, tens of meters, several hundred meters of guano that had built up on top of a rocky um, substrate. Well, this guano was very rich in uh, nitrogen and potassium. And uh, some of the early explorers shipped some of this guano back to Europe and then tried it out as a fertilizer. They got amazing results because the you know, crops had been limited by the availability of natural um, nitrogen. And so many of the, the uh, gardens were at the limits of what they could produce, adding a little bit of this guano um, as fertilizer in these garden plots greatly increased the yield. So it became very popular. And, um, and there were early uh, uh, efforts made to mine this guano and ship it back to Europe uh, for use as fertilizer. And um, the, you know, there's a couple of things that come out here. So this, the, um, you know, the fact that, uh, that, this, that this was profitable, that you could go around the world, you know, 10,000 miles from Europe and harvest, uh, you know, bird shit and put load it up on ships and send it back to um, uh, Europe and have that be a significant contributor to food production sort of indicates, you know, the dynamic balance between uh, food production and uh, the need for uh, essential nutrients for plant growth. So that's one issue. It was also a social issue because um, um, digging these, this guano uh, is a, a tor terrible job. These islands are, as I said, there's no rainfall. So there's a shortage of water. Um, the people that you know, dug these, and this continues. And so here's a, um, you know, here's a historical picture on the upper right. And then here's a present day picture on the lower right uh, showing people shoveling this um, dried uh, bird manure uh, into sacks for export. So it continues to be used um, as this. And, and the, uh, the term, so the, the people that uh, 
you know, were employed, not employed, but uh, uh, ended up digging up this guano, were essentially enslaved people. Uh, they were captured uh, by um, Spanish, Portuguese uh, uh, agents who then, you know, brought them to these islands and kept them there essentially until they died. Uh, so populations of um, uh, Easter Island, uh, Rapa Nui, which I talked about uh, in the beginning of the class, um, these, some of these people were, were you know, forcibly captured and rounded up uh, from Easter Island and taken to the Guano Islands uh, as, as enslaved people uh, to mine guano for the rest of their days. And the term Shanghai, which you may have heard referring to uh, people who were captured, uh, uh, that came from the practice of uh, illegally drugging people. Uh, and then, you know, so they, you'd go into a bar and you'd uh, be offered a drink and uh, the drink would be spiked with something and then people would wake up the next morning on a ship bound for the Guano Islands. So um, there's a, a, a long and rich history of um, these Guano Islands as a component for European agriculture. And um, okay, so where does all this guano come from? So these are the birds and, and you know, the bird populations uh, existing for thousands of years, built up this resource, which human society then exploited to improve its food production. Well, what did the cormorants eat? Well, they eat uh, primarily a fish called the anchovy. And anchovy is a uh, very abundant uh, pelagic fish, pelagic meaning that it lives in the upper portion of the um, uh, water column. It, anchovy eat plankton, zooplankton, and they are extremely productive. So here's a picture of anchovy. Uh, from this picture here, you can see that these are relatively small fish. Um, you might think of them as sardines, and they're all sort of in the glupidae sardine herring um, family. Um, and they have a, a mouth adapted for filtering out um, uh, zooplankton prey. And uh, the populations of uh, anchovy are enormous, huge biomass off the coast of Chile and Peru. So why are there so many anchovies? Well, this has to do with the process of upwelling. And upwelling is something we talk about a lot in oceanography. So those of you who had my oceanography class will understand what I'm talking about. And those of you who might be signed up to take it in the fall uh, will get more of this information. But basically what's happening with anchovy is that the um, uh, northern winds are blowing along the coast of, uh, of um, uh, South America and the transport of this wind um, moves water offshore. And, um, and because the water is moving offshore, deeper water has to upwell and uh, replace that. And this upwelling water is rich in nutrients, which um, are, are, you know, are produced by production that sinks to the bottom. And so upwelling zones are areas of particular productivity uh, for fisheries. And so the upwelling off the coast of South America supports uh, plankton, anchovy, um, and anchovy eat the birds, and the birds eat the anchovy, and they deposit their guano on the, the guano islands, where they used to do. So, um, that's the normal set of circumstances. Under a special set of circumstances or, or wind, a weather or climate pattern called El Nino, um, these winds that um, normally support the upwelling uh, fail. They, they, they become weaker, they change direction. And as a consequence, the upwelling stops. And when the upwelling stops, the anchovy dies. So anchovy are a species that only live about two years. They reach maturity uh, after about seven or eight months. Uh, they can breed once or twice and then they die. Um, so they live and they have a short lifespan. And as a consequence of that short lifespan, if the conditions change very rapidly, there's a very rapid population response that kills off or causes the anchovies to die out temporarily. When the anchovies die out, the birds also die off. And so this, this cycle of uh, you know, high productivity followed by periods of, of El Nino, which caused that productivity to fall off, um, has been a, is a natural cycle. And both the populations of birds and fish are adapted to this uh, climatic variation. Okay. 
So that's the normal set of circumstances. And as we can see from the, you know, the evidence of the accumulation of you know, thousands of years of bird guano, um, that normal population or that normal variability was something that both the anchovy and bird populations had adapted to. Well, um, in uh, the, the story of uh, catching anchovy and catching sardine-like fish, is, there's a long history of that. And there's a particular type of uh, fishing practice which is used for capturing small fish that swim around in the sur surface of the ocean. And that practice is called seining or seine nets. Um, and specifically seine nets are uh, also called purse seine nets. And the idea of a purse seine is that you form a ring on the ocean, around the ocean of, um, of, of nets. And so there's a, a net and the net, the top of the net floats on the surface. That's what these yellow uh, balls are. These are floats that keep the top of the net on the surface. And the bottom of the net hangs down, you know, three or four meters down into the water, five meters down into the water. And it's weighted with a heavy chain that keeps it vertical. So essentially, when you're um, uh, fishing for anchovy, the, um, the um, uh, ship will deploy a small, in this case, a small sh uh, boat will be deployed and it'll uh, make a circle around what they hope will be a big school of anchovy. And then the, the bottom of the net is there's a, a cable uh, that runs around this bottom of the net and that's pulled in tight and that closes the bottom of the net like a purse hence the name purse seining. And then the whole net is hauled on board with these big giant uh, winches here. So, um, you know, the discovery, the mechanization, mechanization of these winches, this is a, actually called a pyretic um, uh, winch, uh, uh, net winch. And this was invented by a Portuguese fisherman in, uh, in uh, uh, Monterey, California. And then the, the technology spread into South America. Well, in the 1950s, this technology reached Chile and, um, and Peru and became very profitable. So they were able to catch huge numbers of anchovy. And this picture shows you, um, you know, what happens when you have a successful persane around a big school of anchovies. So there'll probably be, you know, several uh, tens of tons of fish contained within this one uh, net cast of, uh, of a persane. These are all, and well, not all anchovy, there are other kinds of fish that are going to be in there, um, but the bulk of this, this fish is going to be anchovy. So there's a huge harvest of a fish uh, material, fish biomass, when this net is hauled in. In the case of uh, sardines and herring uh, off the coast of California, this a lot of this was, was used for food. So the, the fish were canned and then sold for human consumption. Off of, in the South American example, most of the fish was used to manufacture uh, fish meal. Uh, so in the early 60s, 1960s, the fishing fleet expanded, catching anchovy expanded very rapidly, and fish meal became a very valuable export product for Chile and Peru. And all of the experts, um, you know, from the United Nations Food and Agricultural Program, all said, well, this is wonderful. Um, anchovy are such a productive fish that you can just expand this fishery um, forever. And um, they, uh, as a consequence, there was a huge investment and many you know, dozens or even hundreds of uh, fishing boats were added to the fleet. And uh, the, the catch, the yield of, of, um, of anchovy just kept increasing um, and seemed to be, you know, uh, one of these great things where there would be money for all and for everyone. And then along in, in 1973 came a particularly severe El Nino year. And as I've described in the previous um, information, with, with this El Nino year, the population of, um, of the upwelling ceased and the anchovy essentially died out. Um, the fishery then, so this was a, a classic sort of boom and bust cycle uh, in the um, uh, uh, anchovy fishery. So here you can see starting in about 1955, the rapid run up, the graph here is millions of tons. And so, you know, we were up to 12 million tons by 1970. And then in 1973, along comes the El Nino year, and this uh, landing is 
completely crash uh, and fall down to, to almost zero. Now, under a normal and El Nino year, without fishing, what would happen when the anchovy died out is the bird populations um, would, um, you know, would, would uh, decrease in size. The fish themselves would, would move closer to shore um, where there was still um, material to support them. And you know, then that relic population was, or that uh, surviving population that had moved inshore was then available when the El Nino uh, conditions uh, were, were uh, declined and uh, the normal production got back to, um, to its previous levels. So that was the normal cycle. Well, what happens when there you have fishing boats involved is that they have bills to pay and uh, people to feed and they can't just uh, die back like the birds do. Instead, the fishing populations followed the anchovy into the uh, closer to shore and began, you know, continue to try to land them. Well, as a consequence, when the El Nino um, uh, conditions lifted, there was very little, very few remaining fish stocks just to, to replenish the populations. And it took, uh, you know, fully a decade for there, begin, for there to begin to be some recovery. And then you can see that the cycle repeated itself. You know, the landings went way up. Um, and there was another El Nino year in 1997, and the landings crashed. And sort of this boom and bust cycle um, becomes a, a, a sort of a characteristic uh, indicator of badly managed and overfished uh, fish population. Well, how does this, how does this um, condition um, come about? Well, the, uh, we have to, um, uh, let's see, let me show a few more slides. This is just by way of background. This is a picture of an island off the coast of, of Chile. Um, you can see the uh, colony of the Gornai, uh, Gorai uh, cormorants uh, living on this rock. Of course, this is a, a, a relatively small colony and the, pop the populations of birds still exist, but their numbers are greatly reduced. And actually most of the guano has been mined off of the guano islands. Um, so this is an example of uh, human activity really impacting uh, you know, a diverse marine ecosystem. Um, but you can see, you know, how these how these uh, these birds live up on the up on the rocks here. This is a, a marine reserve. This whole area is a park. Uh, people are not allowed to land here. So I was part of a tour um, that you know that was able to go out here with a, with a um, delegation that I was part of. Um, and so we got to see these islands. They're they're really cool. Um, there are little penguins, rock hopper penguins that jump around and come down, and then the, the populations of birds are here. Um, when I was there, this is three years ago, four years ago now, I guess, there were um, very unusual um, uh, climate conditions where it was actually raining. Um, and you can see with the rain that the, uh, you can see the sort of the traces of the rain and the rock here. So the rain was actually washing away uh, the guano and, um, you know, the, the, the nesting population is, you know, is greatly reduced. So instead of, you know, one bird on each one of these little um, uh, remnant nests, you know, the population is reduced to a, to a relatively small uh, number. Um, so that's, um, you know, that's the, a little about the conservation of the cormorants uh, off the coast of, of um, uh, Chile in, in, in the modern era. Um, but so how do we, uh, how can we understand how the example of the Peruvian anchovy uh, and its uh, fishery for it and the seasonal variation or the climatic variation caused by uh, El Nino creates this, these unfortunate circumstances of a boom and bust cycle and impact to the marine environment. Well, we have to think about what global fishing are and global fishing ecosystems uh, entail. So, um, you know, this is a map of where uh, global fishing and ocean ecosystems occur. And um, it's also illustrating the um, exclusive economic zone. So the exclusive economic zone is a, uh, a component of the uh, international law of the sea a uh, marine treaty, international treaty that was developed in the 
I think 1969, 1970, uh, the International Law of the Sea was proposed. Most of the nations of the world are signatories to the International Law of the Sea. The United States is not a signatory to the International uh, Law of the Sea. Um, uh, under President Reagan at the time, uh, the Senate refused to ratify the uh, International Law of the Sea because it was thought that the uh, International Law of the Sea would interfere with potential ocean mining that people were interested in in those days. Uh, nonetheless, the United States abides largely by the, um, the uh, principles of the treaty. And one of those principles establishes this e exclusive economic zone. And so the exclusive economic zone extends uh, roughly um, uh, 200 nautical miles from the coast or the islands off the coast of a particular nation. So, uh, for example, here is the exclusive economic zone of um, uh, Brazil. So here's Brazil, and the exclusive economic zone extends 200 nautical miles uh, um, seaward um, from either the coast or from an island offshore um, that that coast. And so. This exclusive economic and within the within the exclusive economic zone, the nations um, or the, the countries that uh, are allowed to control what happens within their EEZ exclusive economic zone. So they're able to regulate uh, in, 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 in particular fishing and other sorts of activities that occur offshore. So here is the coast of, of Chile, what we've been talking about. Uh, Chile's exclusive economic zone extends, uh, you know, offshore here, and then includes this 200-mile uh, EEZ around the uh, Easter Island. Um, so that's the exclusive economic zone of uh, Chile, Ecuador, and so forth. You can also see in the green here. This is uh, where there's high primary productivity. Uh, plankton produ production in the oceans. And so you can see that the econo exclusive economic zone uh, largely tracks where a lot of the marine fishery production occurs. But there's also a great deal of fishing in the open ocean. So uh, within the exclusive economic zone, fishing is regulated by the nations that um, uh, make up the, the EEZ. In the open ocean, it's essentially, um, uh, there is no ownership. And so marine fisheries are characterized as a, um, a kind of activity, sometimes very heavily capitalized, in which there is um, you know, no established ownership. And that a, presents a pretty uh, tricky problem. Um, you know, the uh, fisheries, global fisheries produce about 100 million tons uh, per year. And that compares to about 28 million tons uh, per year that's produced by aquaculture and mariculture. 90% comes from the continental shelves, um, which are dominated by a few major fishing nations. Um, and, you know, the marine fisheries have been characterized by the collapse of the populations of the fish that support them. And there are many, many examples of collapsed fisheries. Now, that would include the Pacific sardine, the Atlantic heron, Peruvian anchovy, as we discussed, most recently Atlantic cod, uh, swordfish are, are, and uh, tuna are in uh, short supply in, in, the, in among other species. So um, unfortunately, uh, marine fisheries have tended to overexploit the populations of fish upon which they depend. So what are the consequences? How can we understand this in a more quantitative sense? Well, um, we've talked about the logistic curve in terms of you know, how populations respond to um, available resources in terms of population growth and ultimately population regulation. And when we uh, talked about this, we introduced this concept of a logistic growth equation. Uh, and you're familiar with this, you know, there's a sort of a, a beginning and then an exponential growth phase, and then a leveling off at the uh, um, carrying capacity of, of the population for a particular region. So, um, you know, uh, you really, you, the population has reached their logistic carrying capacity and the growth rate becomes zero. So we've seen this before. Um, so this is uh, this runoff here, and up here somewhere is the carrying capacity. You know, there's exponential growth in, during this phase, of the, and then it becomes a logistic growth uh, in the uh, later fraction of the phase. 
All right, how does that relate to um, fisheries and how does that relate to an understanding of how a human population might extract a sustainable harvest from a population of, uh, of fish that's otherwise unregulated. Okay, well, um, if you're trying to get a maximum yield out of a population, you would want to extract that from a population that was in its maximum growth phase. In other words, you'd want to be harvesting a population when it was increasing in size, when the largest numbers of uh, individuals were, were being born uh, and becoming available for harvest. So if we think about where, um, you know, if, if we were going to try to begin exploiting a population anywhere along this logistic growth curve, where would we do so? Well, you would do so when the rate of population increase was at its maximum, and that would be in the middle of the exponential uh, uh, component of the logistic growth curve. So, uh, starting in the, you know, after World War II in the 1950s, a, a scientists proposed something called the um, maximum sustainable yield. And the theory of maximal sustainable yield, maximum sustainable yield is that when a fishery is unexploited, um, you know, there's sort of an excess population in the, uh, you know, existing in the wild. And that population can be reduced by removal of individuals through fishing. Reducing the population will take it from its carrying capacity, the time at which the population is not increasing, and reduce that back down uh, to a population size in which there's more food available for any individual and therefore a greater reproductive success, success uh, a larger addition to the population um, with each increment of time. So that's the theory. Um, so the, you, know, you start at the original carrying capacity, you reduce the population down to about half of its carrying capacity. And within that um, size, then you have, uh, you know, in theory anyway, you have the possibility of removing, of catching, of harvesting from that population every year, the, uh, the excess production that would, um, if left unchecked, uh, allow the population to grow back up to its carrying capacity. And so there are a number of different expressions, maximum sustainable yield, optimum sustainable yield. Well, the uh, use of this maximum sustainable yield model requires uh, some information and some assumptions. So um, you know, one of the assumptions is that the population must have a exact carrying capacity and that has to be predictable from the logistic curve, okay? So we have to understand exactly what that carrying capacity was. All right, well, here in this thinking, you know, and using this kind of model, you can see where the experts who were advising uh, the Chileans about expanding their anchovy fishery went wrong because they thought that the carrying capacity was the size of the population um, when there wasn't an El Nino year. Um, and so, uh, you know, not understanding these uh, climatic and natural variations in the population can lead you into some very unfortunate um, um, circumstances. So the other assumption is that the managers are able to know um, what the carrying capacity is and what the population size is. Um, well, knowing what the population size is, is just fine if you're you know, rearing pigs uh, in a pig farm, you can go out and count them. Uh, very different when you have you know, millions of individual fish living in the ocean uh, and you can't see them. Um, so that's another thing. There has to be good information about the size of the population that you're trying to harvest from. There also has to be uh, near perfect cooperation among all the factors that are forces that are acting to harvest the population so that you have to have cooperation and uh, agreement among all the different fishers that are, that are uh, operating on that fishery. And you have to understand what the natural predators on that population might be. Um, so one of the things, one of the places where the, the fisheries managers with the Peruvian anchovy went wrong is that they, when they were calculating how recovery might occur, they forgot to account for the birds. 
Um, so, you know, when the stocks of anchovy began to recover and the fishery, fishers got ready to go out and, and, you know, again and start harvesting them, they forgot that the population of, of cormorants was also going to grow and they would compete with the fishers for some a certain fraction of that population. Um, so the maximum sustainable yield, although it sounds very good in, in theory, in practice, it requires a lot of information and a lot of management that's very difficult to implement. But here it is, um, you know, this is the basic idea. Here's the J-shaped curve and the S-shaped curve is environmental addiction of grows, uh, the growth and carrying capacity. Um, so when there's no competition or predation and plenty of nutrients, the species responds with rapid exponential growth. It stabilizes at its carrying capacity. If we reduce this population down, then in theory, there can be some uh, excess production that we could over time harvest sustainably. Well, um, as I'm sort of indicating, and as you might guess, um, despite you know, the best uh, efforts of fisheries managers and you know, intentions, uh, very often, in fact, in almost all cases, attempts to implement and practice a maximum sustainable yield or an optimum sustainable yield uh, over time, uh, those efforts typically fail um, because fishermen don't cooperate, uh, because there's imperfect knowledge or whatever. So maximum sustainable yield um, and there's a couple of problems built in. So once the fishery is established, when the fishery is first getting started, uh, it's, it's uh, exploiting a very large population. And so the yield to fish to, for fishing, which is something called the catch per unit of effort, it is very large when the fishery starts opening up. And that yield is going to go down when the population is reduced. So initially, um, you know, the, the fishers are going to be uh, getting high landings. And then, you know, as the population size um, is reduced towards this uh, uh, theoretical ma maximum sustainable yield size, the catches of the, the, the fishers are going to go down, um, you know, just according to this theory. Well, you know, managing that soft landing at this maximum sustainable population uh, size has proved beyond the capacity of the capability of fisheries managers in every, in every case. If that happens, um, when you have too large, too much fish trying to be extracted from a, a population, the population uh, is overestimated um, and uh, fishing continues and this can drive uh, fish stocks uh, towards um, not usually not total extinction, but towards um, uh, you know, vast reduction in numbers towards a crash. Well, um, so, uh, you know, this is the sort of a, a kind of a, um, a depressing sort of graph because it sort of shows how maximum sustainable yield, total catch uh, vary over, over time. And, you know, the total catch in, in fisheries has gone down. The total biomass has gone down. The LMAX, the maximum length of adults has decreased and the numbers of of collapsed species has gone up. So this is a, um, you know, this is a, uh, the effects of increasing uh, rate exploitation rate on a model fish community. Um, keeping the fishing alive would be a, uh, an important component, um, but uh, very often that, that fails. So, um, you know, the situation is sort of general when, when you know, you get these uh, collapsed species and declines and, and catches, et cetera, that condition is described as overfishing. Overfishing means extracting um, too many fish from the population to have a sustainable harvest over time. So uh, how can we understand if a population is overfished? Typically, there's a decline in catch. Okay, and as I kind of alluded to earlier, when we think about catch, we have to adjust catch for effort. Um, so, you know, if you go fishing with one fishing pole, uh, you can expect to get a certain number of fish. But if you go fishing and you have, you know, your whole family there and everybody has a fishing pole, um, you know presumably you would catch more fish. And so if you were gonna try to compare your performance uh, fishing from one day to the next, you'd have to adjust that catch uh, 
um, to the number of, uh, of uh, fishing poles that were employed. So the catch um, is, uh, you know, is normalized to catch per unit of effort. So um, if there's a decline in the catch, that means there's a decline in this catch per unit of effort, which is often abbreviated as CPUE. And there's also a reduction. So there's a reduction in the size of the catch, the numbers of fish that are landed, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the weight of the fish. There's a, this, this sharp decline in the seasonal fishery. The individuals which are caught, the fish that are being landed are smaller in size because the larger fish tend to be captured um, uh, first. And then there'll be a sharp decline in fisheries that you know, have a seasonal uh, variation. And typically it's very difficult to, um, to understand that overfishing is occurring. So that, you know, many, um, many fishing operations or fishery management attempts fail because people don't realize that, um, the, uh, that the, the population has been overfished until it's too late. Okay? And you know, we can understand how this, uh, it's difficult to understand, uh, to recognize overfishing when it occurs um, because of this concept called shifting baselines. What do I mean by shifting baselines? Shifting baselines is a, you know, is a problem in, in many different aspects of environmental management. And it describes generally a situation in which um, changes occur gradually over time, it's so gradually that people are sort of accustomed to the present day circumstances and they don't realize that the present day circumstances represent to one degree or another a decline in the environmental health or environmental quality of whatever you're trying to measure. This is pretty easy to understand in the case of uh, shifting ba baselines for fisheries. And there's a series of photographs here and these uh, photographs and this study uh, has been done quantitatively and scientifically. But here we are, we're in, in the Keys and the year is 1958. And we're looking at a recreational or semi-recreational uh, fishing uh, boat called the Greyhound, the Greyhound 2. So there might have been a Greyhound 1 at some point or another. And here are the happy uh, fisher people that have come back from a day offshore on the Greyhound. And these are the fish that they caught in their offshore expedition. Look at these fish. These are mostly um, Goliath. Uh, grouper, you know, they weigh tens or, you know, some of these big ones are probably in excess of 100 pounds. So this is what in 1958 you could do uh, in one day or two days fishing uh, offshore on the Keys. You could catch all these fish. Well, let's step forward in time a little bit to the 1980s. So we go forward on, you know, almost uh, 20 years. And here is the Gulf Stream 3. Again, um, we're going out. There's been a Gulf Stream 2 and a Gulf Stream 1. Uh, and so everybody's come back and uh, they're real happy. They've you know, been offshore, um, they've been fishing, and they've caught a file of fish. Well, this is great. Uh, but you notice the difference in the two pictures. Um, Bunch of differences. First of all, the um, top predators in this uh, picture here are these grouper, the Goliath grouper. Um, this is a snowy grouper. Uh, there's some different species here. Um, so the grouper are gone, pretty much. And it's hard to uh, look at this picture. I don't see any grouper. Well, here's one, a gag grouper here. Um, uh, but all the other uh, fish that they've caught are snapper, um, runner, there's some whatever the fish are here. There's a little cobia. Um, so these are basically snappers. Uh, so they've changed the uh, species that they're catching. And the species are generally, you know, the fish that they're landing are generally smaller. Um, so there's been a shift in the baseline. Well, everybody's smiling because they've had a good day offshore and uh, they've come back with all these fish for their freezer or for their barbecue. Uh, and they might not realize that the baseline has shifted downward. Well, let's skip ahead another uh, 20 years or so uh, to 2007. And here we are back with our old friend, the Greyhound. This time it's the Greyhound 5. And here is the uh, result of uh, um, one day's fishing offshore. Well, you know, <laughs> it's pretty clear that, you know, the, the, you know these are all runners and, and uh, yellowtail snapper. There's a shark here. 
um, you know, uh, not very many species, not very many fish, and the fish that they're catching are a lot smaller. So, um, you know, presumably people are still happy. They're still happy to pay money to go offshore to do this. The, the you know, the Greyhound uh, 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 brand has continued to expand, but year on, year out, the baseline has shifted down and down and down. And it's sad to say that, particularly for the marine environment, and particularly in the case of fisheries, this shifting baselines uh, has been a, a trend in, um, in uh, the uh, communities and wild populations of the ocean. All right, so shifting baselines. We can understand shifting baselines uh, if we look at other trends as well. So here, for example, is uh, going back to 1970, are the numbers of decked fishing vessels. In other words, not open boats, but boats that have a, a deck inside. So these are you know, the more serious, more uh, capitalized uh, fishing uh, boats. And you can see that starting in the 1970s, there's a rapid increase. And then by about 1980, uh, 1990 rather, the numbers of fish uh, decked fishing vessels worldwide, the source here is the Food and Agriculture Organization, sort of begins to level out. And so there's uh, you know, not much change between 1995 and 2004 over this 10 year period. So there's an increase followed by a leveling off. Well, that should remind us of something, shouldn't it? That should remind us of the logistic growth curve approaching carrying capacity. So somewhere in the world here is the carrying capacity of the marine environment for decked fishing vessels. Um, and it's not a perfect analogy, uh, but it's close enough. And it's interesting how the data conform to that. So the number of fishing vessels uh, has started to, you know, to level off. And um, you know, that trend you know, continues or even declines into the present day uh, as a consequence of overfishing and declining fish stocks. And you can see this in um, the Gulf of Mexico. So the trend indicates overcapacity of fishing effort. Well, uh, you go around the Gulf of Mexico. So this is a picture taken in, uh, in Louisiana. All these boats here are shrimp boats. Um, and so they're tied up. They are not able to go offshore. The seasons uh, has been reduced. And you know, these ships, you know, each one of which probably costs uh, $100,000 or more, uh, probably more with the avionics and fishing gear and everything that's on board. Um, they're just sitting idle. Uh, and um, you can see similar trends all around the Gulf of Mexico. Um, when I first came into this region in, in uh, 1980, uh, I had been living uh, in Europe, actually working for the Food and Agriculture Organization. And I came back to the United States uh, thinking I would go to graduate school. And I went uh, down to Galveston and uh, thought I would go offshore uh, on a fishing boat. And I was able to find work as a, a head man uh, on a shrimp boat uh, going out of Galveston. One of the boats, just like one of these, these long booms here are deployed there, so they're lowered down, and then they tow uh, trawl nets, um, sometimes two, sometimes four, um, from these outrigger booms. So I went offshore um, with one of these uh, shrimp, shrimp boats. And my job, so what we would do is we'd lower these nets down and we'd fish all night long, drive around in circles um, and uh, you know, uh, filling up our net. And then in the morning, uh, we'd bring the nets on board, dump them out into a big pile uh, on the back deck. And I would go through and pick out the, um, uh, we would all do it, but I was the one who did most of the work, would go out and pick out the shrimp and then pop off their heads. So you pop the heads off the shrimp tails, and then the shrimp tails were packed in ice and brought back uh, to land. So we did that. I think I was offshore with that fishing boat for like 35 or 40 days. Um, and then we uh, went back uh, to land um, and got done with our cruise, ran out of groceries. And I said, well, gee, I'd like to kind of get paid for my work. And the captain sort of mumbled something about, well, we didn't do very well. And he gave me a check for like $220. Um, so that was uh, some early evidence uh, to me that I was probably not going to make a living as a shrimp fisherman in, in the Gulf of Mexico. And maybe going to graduate school was a good choice. Anyway, that's a little personal history um, by way of uh, explaining 
how the uh, Gulf of Mexico shrimp fleet uh, has been increasingly idled and uh, is less and less productive. Well, fishing is an important source of protein in the United States. It's really important in Africa, um, where uh, you know, food supply for uh, indigenous populations in Africa is really limited. Uh, and in particular, one of the limitations is the availability of protein, um, animal protein. And the shortage of animal protein leads to things like, uh, you know, harvesting of bush, what's called bush meat, um, you know, animals that, and wild animals that are hunted and, and uh, used for food. Uh, but it also produces um, populations uh, of, um, you know, population growth on coastal areas. And so this is a picture of a beach uh, near Senegal. And uh, these are the kind of boats that the Senegalese uh, fishermen go offshore in. So here's a picture here of one of these boats. And uh, these, this, is, uh, this form of fishing would be called artisanal fishing, uh, you know, from the term artisan. And the artisanal fishers are people who are using pretty simple equipment, uh, usually open boats. They usually just go out uh, during the day and come back, or sometimes they'll go out and stay overnight several days and then come back. Um, but they're not mechanized, they're not highly industrialized, and, but they're very, they can be very artisanal fishery and can be very important um, for, uh, as a food supply for local people. Well, off the coast of Africa, the artisanal fishermen uh, compete with these giant um, uh, uh, su uh, super trawlers, and um, so uh, uh, you know that this you know the, 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 they they can really outgunned by the you know these industrial fishing operations, and so there's a real contest between um, you know the local populations and these fishing fleets. The fishing fleets uh, come from different portions of the world. Um, it's kind of, there hasn't been so many reports recently of what they call piracy, um, where, you know, uh, people go out in boats and capture large uh, tank, uh, tankers or fishing boats uh, for, and hold them for ransom. Um, but that has, that is a problem. And a lot of the so-called pirates are, um, you know, local fishers who've been put out of business by these uh, industrial fishing nations. But what are the industrial fishing nations? Um, you know, these are problems and solutions to false small scale fisheries. So, you know, this map here, uh, figure B, um, is showing where the you know, countries that are deploying boats, you know, where the countries are, and then where they go to fish. So, uh, France and Spain um, send boats all around um, uh, Africa. Uh, Russia has uh, fishing boats that fish offshore. So Senegal is like right here, I think. That's Senegal. Here's Senegal. And so, uh, you know, you can see that. Uh, and then uh, Japan and Korea are also sending boats around. So some of these large, um, you know, fishing nations are competing with uh, local fishers. And so that creates uh, issues. All right, so that's a, an example of how you know con, uh, co competition between heavily industrialized fishing and um, uh, local fishing sources can produce uh, unequal uh, outcomes and can also uh, overexploit fish. Well, how can we understand uh, overfishing overexploitation uh, in, in a more concrete way? Well, a good example of an overexploited uh, fish is a particular fish species called orange ruffy. And um, orange ruffy uh, is a, uh, a poster child of an unsustainable fishery. So ruffy uh, is a fish species that lives on deep sea mounts. So sea mounts are rocky uh, protrusions from the sea floor that come up, uh, you know, uh, into you know, they, 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 they come up above the bottom, above the surrounding bottom. They're rocky, um, uh, but they're still quite deep. And so uh, orange ruffy lived down around to 500 meters or so. Um, and, um, but they're, they're tied to these seamounts. That's the habitat that they occupy. Well, um, 
in the 1990s, there was a big effort to use modern acoustic uh, techniques to map the location of you know, thousands of these seamounts and then make that information available to um, uh, fishers from uh, New Zealand and Australia. And um, so that created the possibility of a fishery for this orange roughy. So here you can see a whole net full of uh, orange roughy being brought on board um, and um, uh, being landed. Well, um, what are some problems with catching orange roughy? First of all, uh, like many other deep sea fishes, the orange roughy is very slow growing. So it requires 50 years uh, about to reach reproductive maturity and individuals that are 70, 80, 100 years old are the ones that are the most uh, um, um, reproductive, have the greatest reproductive success. So um, uh, when you go out and catch these fish, because they're large in size, that means that they're all 50, 60 years old. So, um, uh, you know, think about that, compare that to the uh, Peruvian anchovy, which lives for two years uh, versus a fish that can live for 100 years. Well, which population of fish is going to be able to respond most quickly if conditions change? Uh, and uh, which fish uh, would be uh, threatened by overfishing? Well, the answer is pretty clear that orange roughy, uh, because of their long uh, particular life history, taking a long time to reach uh, a maturity, they are susceptible to overfishing. So that's one uh, aspect of this. Another aspect is in order to be able to catch these with trawl nets on these um, uh, uh, coral seamounts, coral covered seamounts, the fishers have to uh, use nets that have giant rollers, metal rollers on the bottom of the, of the trawl nets. I'll, I'll show you what a trawl net is in a little bit here. But these nets uh, go down and they, they catch the orange ruppy, but in the process they destroy the corals and sponges and um, invertebrates that, that make up the uh, community of these seamounts. So this is a very destructive uh, form of fisheries. And then you can see um, you know, that there's this sort of boom and bust cycle once again. So starting in the 70s, they, they map these things. Um, and the fishery um, explodes you know, with this uh, information, and then the whole thing uh, crashes back down. However, you can still, uh, so here's a you know, picture of a, you know, a deep reef um, you know, with um, uh, you know, entanglement on top. You can see corals that have been killed. Uh, so this is you know, the physical uh, destruction to the corals, is, uh, to the seamounts is also. However, you can still buy orange roughy. Uh, this is a picture I took two years ago, um, but I looked the other day and I saw orange roughy back in the store at, um, at Publix. And um, this is a particularly disturbing uh, picture because here it says, um, you know, 100% uh, natural recipe on back. Um, and that there's this little seal here. And this sort of implies that somehow this is a sustainable uh, fish catch. And uh, let me say that uh, I, I thoroughly disapprove of uh, the selling uh, orange roughy, and I greatly discourage uh, my students from um, uh, buying orange roughy at, uh, at, at Publix. And I wish that Publix, uh, Publix has many things to answer for. Um, and uh, you know, continuing to sell orange roughy uh, is one of those. But, so there's an example of an overfished fishery. Well, that orange roughy, uh, unfortunately, is not the only one that's, that's examined there. So uh, if we think about what's you know, seafood, and the idea of seafood is something that's you know, very attractive to a lot of people. A lot of people love seafood. And you know, the ability to go to a, a tourist destination and get good seafood you know, is always a big draw. Um, however, if you look at changes in uh, the seafood menu uh, over time, you can understand that the same sort of shifting baseline that we described you know, for the fisheries offshore, the, the recreational fisheries offshore, the Keys, also applies in an industrial sense. So if you look at the menu of Long John Silver, so here's a menu of Long John Silver is a, a fish food chain, and you look closely here, uh, actually, the seafood is pretty limited. You know, we've got one thing here that could be described as, uh, you know, as, as, um, 
fish. The other things are sort of something else. Um, you know, what is it exactly? If we look on the menu, what's actually missing are wild caught fish. So, you know, we look here and this is a menu that, uh, that I photographed. And so if you wanna get fish at this fish restaurant, your choices are actually pretty limited. And what are fish? Well, they're whitting, tilapia, trout, or catfish. None of those are wild caught fish. You can also get flounder um, and um, shrimp, um, but you know, these are all uh, farmed fish and the shrimp are largely farmed shrimp. So, um, you know, the, the reduction in the populations of, of, uh, of global fishing has produced uh, changes in the uh, availability of, uh, of seafood uh, around. So um, we can also, I uh, also wanna talk about the, uh, the way in which we process fish for, for consumption. If you go to McDonald's, uh, which I talked about uh, on Tuesday with reference to hamburgers, you can also get something called a fish burger. Well, the fish burger is actually um, made up of something called a fillet, uh, not to be confused with a fillet. Uh, a fillet is a fish burger, which is sold by McDonald's and others. What a fillet is, is a, um, uh, they take uh, fish, uh, fish meat, and they chop it up, grind it up and they mix it with binders and uh, other sorts of things. And they shape it into a patty, which they then bread and deep fry. Um, and so that's what you get when, you, when you're served a fish burger at McDonald's is one of these uh, fillots. And fillots have been made from many different species. Uh, and the process is similar to when you get crab, you know, K-A-R-B -K -R and other faux uh, seafoods. So uh, McDonald's currently uses the Alaska Pollock, uh, which is a trawl caught species. Alaska Pollock is, um, you know, here's a Pollock. They're fairly good sized. They're also planktivores, and they are huge populations of uh, Alaska Pollock off Alaska. Um, and so most of the, the fish that you're eating are actually this fish. Now, what's notable here is that if you took a Pollock, um, it wouldn't be at all an attractive sort of fish. Um, you know, you wouldn't, you know, it's kind of soft tissued and uh, it's really not too palatable until it's chopped up and treated with this industrial process to make fish for lot. Okay, well, in the time remaining, uh, I'm gonna just quickly go through several different uh, methods of uh, uh, fishing. Um, so how do we catch these fish? And so the uh, first thing I want to talk about is something called trawling. And I referred to trawling at a couple of different points. The shrimp are caught, the brown shrimp in the Gulf of Mexico are caught by trawling. Uh, trawling uses a net that has, um, it's essentially a large bag that's um, uh, pulled across the bottom. And uh, the important component of the fishing are the trawl doors or otter boards, and these are solid uh, wood or metal um, structures that um, attach to either side of the, the trawl net. And so there's a single uh, bridle that comes back to the surface, and as the, the net is pulled across the bottom, the, the, the uh, two trawl doors act like um, uh, wings and the hydrostatic pressure forces them apart and keeps the, 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 uh, the net open uh, from side to side. The top of the net has a series of floats and that tends to keep it up um, floating up open from top to bottom and the bottom of the net uh, is weighted with a chain or lead uh, to make it drag across the bottom. So the, when I was talking about the, uh, the, the trawl nets that were so destructive in, uh, for the orange roughy fishery, there would have been a whole series of big iron uh, metal rollers across the bottom uh, uh, of the trawl net. And then pulling that across the, um, the, the, the sea mounts um, would have kept the, protected the net, allowed it to, you know, to go over the bottom without being destroyed. Um, but those rollers essentially act like you know, a steamroller uh, going across delicate. Um, so what are, what are um, trawl nets used for? Uh, fish that live on the bottom called demersal fish. There are also midwater trawls that are, um, don't go on the bottom, that just sort of go through the, 
through the water. So Alaska pollock are more pelagic than cod or other species, and so they're caught with midwater trawls. But cod and shrimp, orange roughy, uh, are typical species that are caught by trawling. Um, and so, you know, the, the trawl fishery for cod uh, is a you know long-standing fishery, and cod historically was you know one of the great uh, resources that uh, was available for food for the you know settlers and early citizens of the United States. Uh, people came over from France and Britain uh, to fish for cod off the Grand Banks. Uh, so cod and shrimp have been some of the economically most important uh, fisheries. And the brown shrimp, um, the, land, the value of the brown shrimp landings from the Gulf of Mexico, um, you know, one of the, the more important um, uh, economic uh, uh, fish stocks. Both of these caught, um, uh, not exclusively, but uh, typically with the trawl nets. Another method that we've already talked about is this concept of purse seining. So um, this is the net being laid out. Uh, you saw earlier the picture that I showed of it, the net being hauled in. Before it's hauled in, it's deployed with one of these small boats. So the idea is that there's a purse seiner, there's a skiff that goes around and pulls this, uh, the net around in a big um, ring. Um, here's the float line. Uh, here is the, the uh, lead line, the bottom, and then there's this bridle, this purse that uh, allows the, um, um, the, the, the saner to close the bottom of the net by hauling in on these cables. So the square net deployed in a circle and pursed at the bottom. The kind of fish that are caught in there include anchovy, um, but uh, in the Gulf, one of the more important fish species is um, a, a fish called minhaden, also called porgies, uh, pogies rather. And um, so pogie uh, and minhaden fishers use um, uh, uh, purse seines uh, to catch those. Minhaden is, is also like, uh, like anchovy, uh, largely used for fish meal. So if, uh, and a lot of that fish meal ends up as um, uh, food stuff for catfish farms. And so um, that's, you know, one of the, the series there. What are other methods of uh, so same caught fish? Here's a, a picture of a minhaden, and then here's the anchovy that we've already talked about. Uh, Peruvian anchovy were a classic boom and bust fishery uh, linked up well in, in El Nino, as I described earlier. Um, the minhaden catches are still pretty stable in the Gulf. Uh, the, the oil spill was uh, pretty hard on, um, uh, on uh, minhaden, uh, but the stocks seem to have recovered and they are you know, continue to support fishery. Another method is um, what's called long lining and long line caught fish. So these are long lines of, of hooks that are put out. These hooks can be miles long um, and they're deployed. Uh, and there's a couple of uh, unfortunate environmental impacts. Uh, first of all, uh, in order to bait the hooks, they have to catch a lot of fish. And a lot of that bait just goes to waste um, another problem is that they catch species that, you know, um, are endangered otherwise. So the turtles, porpoises can get hooked on, sharks can get hooked on these things. And then a third problem is that uh, sometimes these, there'll be a storm or some other event and these uh, long lines will break free and they'll continue to be what are called ghost fishing gear. Um, so they're, they're not being removed. They just, you know, people, uh, people fish come in and bite on the hooks, they get caught. Other fish come in to eat the fish that are caught on the hooks and they get caught. Um, so this is, you know, a really unfortunate uh, thing that goes on. A long line fat caught fish includes swordfish and tuna, um, pelagic species with a very high market value per fish. Uh, to support that. Okay. I think now um, I'm going to skip over to um, skip past some of this information and talk about the uh, ecosystem collapse. And so, for, well, I really don't have time. I guess I've run out of time here. 
So uh, let me uh, stop and uh, answer any questions uh, about the material that I've covered here. And uh, I've, I've put this uh, PowerPoint presentation online. And so you can follow through with some of this other material. So any questions? Um, so would it be uh, Somebody had a question? <laughs> Two people tried to ask, so um, go ahead, uh, Berta. I just wanted to ask that in terms of environmental impact, is having a diet that as a pescatarian better for the environment? Because after the lecture from today, it doesn't really seem that way. <laughs> but <laughs> there is a lot of uh, misinformation out there, um, perhaps because there is a lot of places that do consider a pescatarian diet more environmentally friendly than a... Yeah, it's a real tough one, Berta, and I don't know the answer. I mean, I, uh, I'm a vegetarian. Uh, I don't eat meat. I used to eat meat, and I had this odd thing. I would eat meat, but I didn't like to eat fish because of the you know, wild-caught overfishing problem. But then I stopped eating meat, and I wanted to continue to get some animal protein. So I, I started, so now what I, when I want to eat fish, I eat either catfish or um, uh, tilapia that are farm raised fish and they're raised in pretty sustainable uh, you know, circumstances. So that's my compromise. Um, and uh, catfish is a, is a excellent fish. Uh, um, so is tilapia, um, they're, they're, they're fine fish to eat. Um, but, you know, I don't eat tuna fish. Um, okay. And uh, <laughs> I guess, let's see, um, there's a, a number of different sources for this. Let me see if I can find, I have to skip past a lot of stuff here. Um, okay, so here are, um, you know, you can find these things in a variety of places, best choices. Uh, these are fish, um, you know, what they recommend. And so Arctic char, uh, catfish, clams, cod, halibut, um, spiny lobster, mussels, oysters, Alaska pollock, salmon. These are all tilapia, trout, farms. So these are all fish um, uh, that are harvested in a reasonably sustainable way. Here are some good alternatives. Um, to that. Um, and so you can find these, you know, guides in, in a variety of places. You should avoid um, these fish, um, uh, Chilean sea bass, toothfish. Um, these are, you know, the sea bass and toothfish are other names for um, uh, orange roughy. Uh, uh, king crab, flounders, groupers, halibut, you know, Caribbean lobster, mahi mahi, you know, all these fit orange roughy, um, these are all uh, fish that should be avoided. Um, and uh, so, you know, if you're concerned about sort of personal choices, that's the way to think about that. Gotcha, thank you. Other questions? I was curious if there are any statistics on, so you know how there's uh, like pollution will come from in, or, yeah, industrial fishing? Yeah. Um, in terms of like recreational fishing, are there any statistics that have been put together over like the pollution that is just within recreational fishing? You mean like, uh, you know, plastics pollution or? or... Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. Uh, there probably are. I'm not familiar with any uh, particular studies on that. I know that, you know, uh, monofilament is, you know, from uh, people's you know, fishing poles is a, is a big problem. And recycling monofilament is a you know is something that you know, they really encourage you to do. I don't know. Are you a, do you go fishing? Yeah, uh, I, uh, I fished quite a bit. But I was curious um, because there's a growing industry in recreational fishing for the past like I don't know, decade or two with the, the growth of the internet. Uh huh. But, um, that involves a lot of like like lures and and pieces that are either made of hard plastic or soft plastic. And right. You know, that's not a those aren't permanent baits. I mean, the soft plastic, you catch a couple fish and then you end up throwing them all away. Yeah. So I, I'm sure there's just a, an immense amount of like plastic pollution that comes from that or not even pollution, yeah. like waste products. Yeah. I, and you know, like if you, I think if you 
you know, if you've ever done, if you've ever gone diving, <laughs> one oh, yeah. of the things that you yeah. see a lot of are lures and sinkers and, you know, all that stuff. And then the monofilament is really bad. Yeah. Um, so I think this, you know, like Academy and, and some of these other stores, you can go in with your, you know, with your, um, uh, you know, your fishing pole and they'll pull off all your monofilament line if you want to get new line and they'll recycle that. Um, so that's a good thing to do. You know, a lot of people will, you know, will just, you know, they'll catch something and they'll break their line and they'll just leave that monofilament in the water. That's horrible. Um, but I don't, I don't know of any, I'm sure you could, you know, dig into it in literature and find some, but I'm not, I'm not aware of any. I'm, you know, I tried looking a little bit before, actually in our previous class, um, mm -hmm. the other OCE class, mm -hmm. uh, I tried looking into it because we were looking at like the effects of industrial or not, I mean, commercial fishing. Yeah. And, like, pollution the blast pollution from the nets and stuff um but i couldn't really find any like solid literature i don't know if i was just not looking in the right place but it's uh it's definitely interesting because that's just it's just going to keep growing for the next you know couple decades and i'm, I'm sure somebody is going to have to worry about it soon yeah well uh, and recreational fishing you know there are you know there are examples of overfishing by recreational um, mm -hmm. fishers one of the issues in the gulf is that there are these uh, offshore platforms and what the offshore platforms do is they allow people to go way offshore, you know, 100 miles offshore in an open boat uh, and fish. And, you know, as a consequence, there's impact on, you know, tuna populations and other populations where people wouldn't, you know, the, the, the platform is a sort of a fish attraction structure. And so that aggregates fish around the platform. And it also gives um, people coming from offshore a target. And so recreational fishing can have a, you know, an impact on, on, on populations. I'm sure. Thank you. Uh, happy birthday, by the way. Thank you. That's right. Today's my birthday. So everybody. You did, uh, you happy definitely birthday. Birthday. <laughs> Don't sing. <laughs> <laughs> you should check the chat. Happy birthday, professor. Have a good one. Thank you. Appreciate Bye. It. Happy birthday. Okay, Happy goodbye, birthday. everybody. Stop and so if you haven't scheduled your conference, get ready and schedule that. Uh, so far, I've had pretty good luck with the with the, the teams I've talked to. They seem like you're doing a solid job, but make sure that you give yourself that advantage by uh, getting, a, getting a conference going. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end here now and uh, look forward to seeing you next week when we'll be talking about climate change. Hi, Professor. Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Lots of happy birthdays. <laughs>